إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله So we were discussing the chapters of magic and we arrived at the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said ala hal unabbi'ukum mal'adhu hiya al-namima al-qalatu bayna al-nas rawahu muslim in this hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said shall I not inform you what adhu is shall I not inform you what al-adhu is and he said it is a namima spreading the tales and the stories between the people and uh, these tales carrying them between the people the purpose of this narration is to highlight that this al-adhu is essentially a type of magic meaning the purpose of that to say is that spreading the stories spreading the tales between the people there is a great danger behind that and it causes splitting between people, spreading the stories and the tales between the people to cause corruption between them. It causes splitting to occur between the people. And as a consequence of that splitting, it is like magic. Magic causes the splitting to occur between the people. So here the Shaykh, Shaykh Al-Fawzan says, هَذَا فِيهِ التَّعْلِيمِ بِطَرِيقَةِ السُّؤَالِ وَالْجَوَابِ In this is an education of the people, teaching the people through question and answer. And this is one of the ways of the Prophet ﷺ, that when he would teach the companions, he would teach them in question and answer format. Meaning, he would ask them questions on purpose, so that they would become focused and they would become uh, attracted, their minds would be attached to this question, they would be focused, and then he would give them the answer. So this was one of the styles of the Prophet ﷺ in giving the da'wah. One of the ways of the Prophet ﷺ in giving the da'wah. That he would ask companions questions on purpose to gain their attention, to gain their focus. And then he would give them the answer. So that is what the Prophet ﷺ did here. He asked them the question, Allah, هَلْ أُنَبِّئُكُمْ مَلْعَضُ Shall I inform you what this adhu is, what this magic is? So now they are all focused. They want to learn, what is it then? So then the Prophet ﷺ tells them, here namima. It is the namima, the tail carrying between people to cause corruption. And that is therefore highlighting how severe and how dangerous namima is. How this tail carrying, how dangerous it is. وَهَذَا لِبَيَانْ خَطَرِ النَّمِيمَةِ كَأَنَّ النَّبِيَّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ حَصَرَ السِّحْرِ فِيهَا تَحْضِيرًا مِنْهَا So it's as if the Prophet ﷺ is now restricting or mentioning magic into this affair of tail carrying. That it's a type of magic, meaning that you are causing the corruption between the people and splitting between the people by spreading the tales and the stories amongst them. So why is it so dangerous, this tail carrying? لِأَنَّ النَّمِيمَةَ تَعْمَلُ عَمَلَ السِّحْرِ Because this tail carrying, storytelling, it has the impact, the same type of consequence as magic does. فَتُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ كَمَا يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَهُمُ السِّحْرِ So Namima, telling the stories and carrying these tales between people to cause corruption and split between them, that is the same as what magic does. Magic splits between the people, and so does this tale carrying and storytelling between the people. Bal hiya ashad. Some of the scholars have even said it is even more carrying tales and stories between people to cause corruption and splitting between them causes even greater harm in that splitting than magic does. Kama qala ba'dhum yufsidu namam fi sa'ah. مَا يُفْسِدُهُ الصَّاحِرُ فِي سَنَةِ 
Some of the scholars, they said, a person who carries these stories and tales between the people to cause corruption and to split people up and to cause fighting between them. Somebody who does that for one hour, one hour going around causing this corruption and spreading these tales and stories, one hour of doing that has the same impact equivalent to a magician doing his uh, magic and his affair and the corruption that he causes in a whole year. The storyteller, the tale carrier causes the same corruption in an hour as what the magician does in a year. Because you go telling people stories, telling people tales, this happened and that happened and they did this and they said this about you. And you cause corruption between people and evil between people and fighting between people. So some of the scholars said this type of person causes more damage in an hour than a magician does in a year. فَالنَّمِيمَ أَشَدُّ تَأْثِيرًا مِنَ السِّحْرِ So this tail carrying is more of an impact. It has more consequence, more evil to it in the result of it than magic in terms of the splitting that it causes. One of the reasons for that, they say because tail carrying splits between the people as a whole. You could go to one group of people and tell them another group of people have been saying this and that. So this whole group of people splits up from that whole group of people. It impacts upon a lot of people. Whereas magic only impacts upon the person the magic is done upon. So in this way again, this storytelling and tale carrying between the people, it can cause great corruption. The Shaykh says a precise definition of what this namima is. نَقْلُ الْحَدِيثِ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ عَلَى وَجْهِ الْوِشَاوَةِ وَالْإِفْسَادِ It is to carry stories between people with the intent, with the angle of causing corruption between them. Of causing corruption between those people. يَذْهَبُ إِلَى شَخْصٍ فَيَقُولُ له. A person goes to someone and says to him, إِنَّ فُلَانًا يَسُبُّكَ وَيَتَنَقَّصُكَ he goes to somebody and says, you know such and such, he was saying bad things about you and he was criticizing you and he was belittling you. And he tells him all types of things like that. وَيَقُولْ فِيكَ كَيْتَ وَكَيْتَ And he was saying this about you and that about you, such and such about you, such and such about you. So he goes and spreads these types of stories to that person. ثُمَّ يَغْضَبْ هَذَا الشَّخْصْ عَلَى فلان. Then that person will become angry upon that other individual. He will become angry upon the individual who he is being told is talking about him. ثُمَّ ila إِلَى thani. Then that same person who informed this individual will now go to the other person and he will start saying to him, إِنَّ فُلَانًا يَقُولُ فِيكَ كَذَا وَكَذَا وَيَسُبُّكَ وَيَتَنَقَّصُكَ That such and such was abusing you and cursing you and speaking bad about you as well. So then he will get angry and he will want to cut off the first person. So in this way, corruption is caused between the people and the cutting off is caused between the people. And this could end up in a father cutting off his son, a brother cutting off his brother, a Muslim cutting off another Muslim, breaking their ties with them, having enmity and fighting between them. And that is why Namima, this tale carrying between the people and speaking of the affairs between the people, it is from the major sins. It is from the major sins. And قَدْ بَيَّنَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَنَّ النَّمِيمَةَ مِنْ أَسْبَابِ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم informed us that Namima is from the causes of the punishment of the grave. The one who spreads the Namima goes around carrying the tales and the stories between the people. Then that type of individual, it is a cause for the punishment of the grave upon him, for having carried the tales and the stories to corrupt between the people. And that is in the hadith when the Prophet ﷺ marra bi qabarayni faqal, the Prophet ﷺ went past the two graves and he said, إِنَّهُمَا لَيُعَذَّبَانِ وَمَا يُعَذَّبَانِ فِي كَبِيرٍ أَمَا إِنَّهُ كَبِيرٍ أَمَّا أَحَدُهُمَا فَكَانَ يَمْشِ بِالنَّمِيمَ وَأَمَّا الْآخِرِ فَكَانَ لَا يَسْتَبْرِئُ مِنَ الْبَوْلِ the Prophet ﷺ said, these two individuals in their graves are being punished. They are being punished. And they're not being punished for something big, but rather it was actually big. I.e. those two people thought that these actions they were doing were minor. They thought the actions they were doing were minor. But the Prophet ﷺ now explains they were major actions. As for one of them, 
He used to go around causing corruption between the people, spreading these stories between the people. Such and such, they were saying this, and that group of people, they were saying that, and that guy was saying this, and going and telling people here and there to cause corruption between them. So he will be punished in the grave. That is one of the punishments uh, associated to that action. And also the second person, because he never used to look after himself when urinating. He would not look after himself when urinating. The splashes would go everywhere. He wouldn't cover himself, etc. And that is also another reason for the punishment of the grave. In another hadith it says, لا يدخل الجنة نمام a, back, uh, uh, a storyteller, a tale carrier, a namam who does namima, he will not enter paradise, he mentions in this hadith. وَلَا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ فَتَّاتِ The person who spreads this namima will not enter paradise. وَالنَّمَّام لَيْسَ لَهُ حُكْمِ sahir. So the one who spreads the tales between the people, we don't say he's actually a magician. He's not actually a magician, but what he's doing is similar to the activities of a magician. What he's doing is similar to the activities of a magician in terms of causing the corruption between the people and the destruction between the people. So here the Prophet ﷺ made the example of to- storytelling and carrying these tales between the people as a type of magic in the consequences of it, indicating how severe that sin is and how major that sin is. Then after that, وَلَهُمَا عَنْ إِبْنِ عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا أَنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم قال إِنَّ مِنَ الْبَيَانِ لَسِحْرًا Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Indeed from the speech can be magic Certain types of speech How people talk Their eloquence This can be a type of magic And that is when somebody speaks in a very eloquent way Speaks in a very beautified manner That type of speech can attract the hearts of the people and it can cause the hearts of the people to become grasped by his speech so it's as if he is performing magic with his speech by taking the minds of those people uh, having the minds of those people attached to him now from the speech that he makes so this type of eloquence in speech the prophet ﷺ mentioned that it can be a type of magic the way that it takes in the people and emotionally attaches the people, the one who speaks in this beautified and eloquent way. And that can be something good sometimes and it could be something bad. The one who uses that eloquence and good speech to call to Allah <coughs> and to give da'wah, then that is good. But the one who uses this eloquence in exaggeration and into uh, falsehood and to take the people into ignorance, then that is the one who is upon misdeed and wrongdoing. So what do we benefit from these narrations altogether in this chapter? Firstly, at the beginning of the chapter, we realized that there are certain types of actions that are considered from magic. The superstitions were considered from magic. When they used to listen to the birds, which way the birds fly, the superstitions that they used to have, those types of things are all types of magic. When they used to draw lines in the sand, and now how they do it with the lines on your hand, All of these things are from the types of magic. Similarly, we learned that astrology, going into depth with regards to astrology and those types of affairs is not permissible. And you only use the stars for the permissible things that have been mentioned, for the times of the prayers, the sun it moves, and the times of the seasons that the people know, the directions from the stars, which way to go, those things are permissible. But over and above that, to delve into the science of astrology and stars and how they impact and start talking about star signs, all of that is haram from the types of magic too. Similarly, we learned that whomsoever puts his trust into these magicians, into these fortune tellers, then that person will be abandoned to whatever he put his trust in. So if he puts his trust into these magicians, he'll be abandoned by Allah, left by Allah, to his own devices with those magicians, and they'll do nothing for him. That person will be left to whatever he is putting his trust in. Also, we learned just now 
that Namima spreading the tales and the stories between the people to cause corruption is a major sin and a type of magic in the consequences of it, the end result of it in splitting between the people. And sixthly, we've seen that the eloquent speech which is used to promote falsehood, then that is also from the types of magic, the eloquent and beautified speech that the people use to promote the falsehood and to promote their wrongdoing. Then we move on to the chapter after that, which is Babu ma jaa fil kuhan wa nahwihim. The chapter regarding what has been mentioned about the fortune tellers, the sorcerers, and those similar to them. Fortune tellers and sorcerers and those similar to them. Fortune tellers, sorcerers, these types of people, what they do, their actions, their behavior, it is all using the shaitan, shayateen. They work with the shayateen of the jinn, they work with those individuals, they submit themselves to those individuals. So this is all very tightly linked to the topic of magic. How these individuals, these fortune tellers and sorcerers submit themselves to the shayateen of the jinn to be able to do what they do. And that therefore means that they are opposing the correct aqidah, they are upon shirk as well. They are upon shirk in order to do what they do. So the Kuhan, who are the Kuhan? The Kuhan, the Sheikh says, الَّذِي إِدَّعَى عِلْمَ الْغَيْبِ بِطُرُقْ شَيْطَانِيَّةِ Or it is, this sorcery, it is to claim to have knowledge of the unseen. To claim to have knowledge of the unseen through satanic methods. بِطُرُقْ شَيْطَانِيَّةِ Through satanic methods. Using the shayateen, uh, using those jinn to claim that you have knowledge of the unseen because those shayateen of the jinn they will be able to move quickly go from here from there to get the information and fill you in and then you can tell the people I know this and I know that and you claim to have knowledge of the unseen so that is what this is and these types of people will therefore tell you where missing things are you have something missing, they will have the shayateen, the shayateen will go and check everywhere quickly and find it, where this missing thing has gone, and then they'll come back and tell the fortune teller, he then tells the people, and the people find those things, and they say, look, this man has knowledge of the unseen, he knew exactly where our item was, where to go, where to look, and we found it there. So these types of people, they do this by working for the shayateen, by submitting themselves to the shayateen. Because the shayateen, they have an ability more than the humans in this. لِأَنَّ شَيَاطِينَ عِنْدَهُمْ مَقْدَرَ لَيْسَتْ عِنْدَ الْإِنسِ They have an ability which the humans do not have. فَهُمْ يَرْتَفِعُونَ فِي الْجَوْءِ They can fly up in the air. وَيَحَاوِلُونَ اسْتِرَاقَ السَّمْعِ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And they climb on top of their backs so high up that they try to steal information from the heavens as we saw. ثُمَّ يَخْبِرُونَ بِمَا يَسْمِعُونَ مَنْ يَخْضَعُ لَهُمْ مِنَ الْإِنسِ then they will come and tell people what they heard. But which people will they come and tell? The ones who humiliate themselves in front of the shayateen. They worship the shayateen. They prostrate to the shayateen. Those types of people, they will tell them then. Then they will come in front of the people as if they are these people of knowledge of unseen and tell them the fortunes and tell them what's going to happen in future. After they themselves have committed shirk with the shayateen in the first place to get that information. وَلَا تُخْبِرُهُ الشَّيَاطِينَ إِلَّا إِذَا أَطَعَهُمْ And the shayateen will not tell them this information unless those people obey the shayateen. When the people obey the shayateen, then the shayateen will tell them these things. And so the people who obey the shayateen, they have disbelieved in Allah. Those individuals have disbelieved in Allah, they've committed kufr. If they prostrate and they obey the shayateen, instead of Allah, to be able to get the information from the shayateen. وَإِلَّا فَالشَّيَاطِينَ لَا تُطِيعَ الْمُؤْمِنِ Otherwise, the shayateen do not just come and obey the humans. They don't just come and give the information. Rather, they want the humans to be subservient to them. They want the control over the humans. And these humans will then bow to them, prostrate to them, humiliate themselves to them, submit themselves to them. And then those shayateen will give them the information they want. 
The Sheikh says, كانت الكهانة أو الكهانة سوقا رائجة عند العرب في الجاهلية That sorcery and fortune telling was a big market amongst the Arabs in the times of Jahiliya. This was something widespread. These sorcerers, these magicians, these fortune tellers, it was something widespread amongst the Arabs in the times of Jahiliya. وَكَانَ الْكُهَّانَ لَهُمْ شَأْنٍ عِنْدَ الْعَرَبِ كُلُّ قَبِيلَ لَهَا كَاهِنْ يَتَحَاكَمُونَ إِلَيْهِ And the Arabs, they used to give status and position and rank an honor to these magicians and sorcerers and fortune tellers. All of the tribes would have in their tribe one person who was the recognized fortune teller sorcerer and they would go back to him and he would be the judge in their affairs. So they gave status and they gave rank to these fortune tellers and sorcerers. فَلَمَّا بَعَثَ اللَّهُ نَبِيَّهُ مُحَمَّدًا صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ قَلَّتِ الْكِهَانَ عَمَّا كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then this sorcery fortune telling, it went down, it decreased. This sorcery, this fortune telling, all of these types of things that were prevalent everywhere before that, widespread before that, it started to go down. Because when Islam came, and it became apparent, and it clarified the truth from the falsehood, uh, then the magicians and the sorcerers, they began to dwindle in numbers. People began to accept Tawheed and understand Islam. So then it became less. وَكُلَّمَا فَاشَ الْجَهْلِ فِي الْأُمَّةِ ظَهَرَ الْكُهَّانِ وَكُلَّمَا كَثَرَ الْعِلْمَ التَّمَسُّكْ بِالدِّينِ وَالْعَقِيدَةَ الصَّحِيحَ قَلَّ الْكُهَّانِ أَوْ انْقَرَضُوا So whenever the Shaykh says there is ignorance amongst the people, ignorance lack of knowledge spreads amongst the societies. Those are the types of societies where these magicians and fortune tellers and sorcerers get their biggest market. The ignorant people who don't know any better about Tawheed, they are upon ignorance, they are upon far from the correct aqidah. Those are the types of people these magicians and fortune tellers and sorcerers target. But the people who have knowledge and they cling on to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, then in those places you'll find very few magicians and fortune tellers and sorcerers. Because the people of that area are clinging to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and Tawheed. So in those places there'll be very few to the extent that they may altogether vanish. None left in those areas where the societies are upon the clinging of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So here he mentions this chapter regarding these fortune tellers and these sorcerers. The first hadith that he mentions then, Rawa Muslim fi Sahihihi, Al Imam Muslim narrated in his book Sahih Muslim. And Ba'adi Azwaj from one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. From one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And in another narration it's mentioned it was Hafsa the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. It's mentioned that she narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مَنْ أَتَى عَرَّافًا فَسَأَلَهُ عَنْ شَيْءٍ فَصَدَّقَهُ بِمَا يَقُولْ لَمْ تُقْبَلْ لَهُ صَلَاةٍ أَرْبْعِينَ يَوْمًا Whomsoever goes to a fortune teller, goes to one of these sorcerers, one of these fortune tellers, and asks him, asks him about his affairs, wants to know from the fortune teller what he can predict for him about his future, goes there and asks him about these things, and believes in the fortune teller and what the fortune teller tells him, then this person, his prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. His prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. The scholars, they mention, the hadith says whoever goes to a fortune teller, and asks him and believes in what he tells him, etc. What about a person who doesn't actually go to a fortune teller, but he just watches him on TV? Fortune tellers with the crystal ball and all of these things, and the tarot cards and whatever they have, they come on TV and people watch them. They're curious. How do these people do it? All this fortune telling, and they're telling the people, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. Scholars say if you watch that kind of thing on television, these magicians, fortune tellers, sorcerers, all of that type of stuff, 
this same ruling applies to you. Some of the scholars, they mentioned that. The same ruling applies to you because you're still going to the fortune teller. If you're sat there watching him on TV, listening to everything he's saying, it's the same as going there, listening to him and talking to him in person. You're doing the same thing. You're listening to and following what this fortune teller is saying, taking in everything he's saying, giving him attention to what he's saying, whether it's on the television or whether it's in person. So some of the scholars, they mentioned the same ruling applies, your prayer would not be accepted for 40 days. That's why it's impermissible to watch any type of magic or sorcery or fortune telling, hand reading, anything. Impermissible to watch that or to read that, not on YouTube, not on TV, not in person, anywhere. It's impermissible to watch that or to engage in that. Even if a person says, I know it's wrong, I'm just interested, curious, I know it's all haram, it's shirk. I'm not going to do it, but just out of interest, I want to see what's going on. Haram, impermissible to do that. Impermissible to watch magic and these magicians doing what they do. You have these magicians all over the place now, they claim they can do this, they can do that, they can stay in a box, they can cut themselves, they can stab themselves. These programs come on TV. They look at the cards, they can tell you which one it is. All these different things they do. Haram to watch this type of thing. Haram to even watch it on YouTube or whatever. It's impermissible watching it. Even if you say, I know, I know, I've read it, I understand the Tawheed and Shirk. I know magic and everything is wrong, but just out of curiosity, I want to see what he's doing. I know it's all wrong, I'm not going to believe anything. Even if you say that, it's impermissible to watch it. The only types of people, the scholars, they say, who could go and talk to a magician and get involved is somebody who is grounded in knowledge who goes there to refute him. Somebody grounded in knowledge who goes there and has the understanding, has the evidences, and he could stand up to this magician and put him down in his place, that is something different. As for everybody else, the masses of people, then it is not permissible to go to a magician, source or a fortune teller, watch it on TV, listen to it, read the articles, nothing. It is not permissible to engage in that at all. So here the Prophet said, whoever goes to an Arraf, whoever goes to one of these people like a, a, a fortune teller, he guesses and he tells you this is going to happen to you and that's going to happen to you and this and that makes these guesses about the people and predicts their future. Then whoever goes to these types of people, uh, the ones who make these predictions about your future and you believe in what he tells you, uh, then that person... His prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. So is it a condition, the hadith says, whoever goes there and believes in what he hears. What if somebody goes there and doesn't believe in what he hears? Somebody says, look, I know it's all wrong. I'm not going to believe in anything. And genuinely, he goes there, doesn't believe in any of it. Just listens out of interest. The hadith says who believes in it. There's another narration where believing in it is not mentioned as any type of condition or anything in the hadith. The other hadith just says, Man ata arrafan lam lahu <coughs> Whoever goes to one of these fortune tellers, his prayer won't be accepted for 40 days. It doesn't even mention whether you believe him or not. So that's not really the point, whether you believe him or not. If you go to these fortune tellers, even out of curiosity, whatever, it's mentioned here, whoever goes to them, prayer is not accepted for 40 days even without whether you believe in them or you don't believe in them. It's just about going to them, that the ruling then applies, your prayer will not be accepted for 40 days, and in another hadith, 40 nights. This therefore indicates to you how severe it is, somebody who goes to one of these fortune tellers. Uh, وَأَنَّ صَلَاتَهُ لَا تُقْبَلُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And that the prayer of that person will not be accepted by Allah. وَلَا ثَوَابَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ فِيهَا And he'll not get any reward for those prayers. وَإِنْ كَانَ لَا يُؤْمَرُ بِالْإِعَادَةِ لِأَنَّهُ صَلَّى فِي الظَّاهِرِ لَكِنَّ فِي مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ صَلَاتُهُ لَا ثَوَابَ لَهُ فِيهَا لِأَنَّهَا غَيْرْ مَقْبُولًا So does that mean this person doesn't have to pray for 40 days then if he ended up doing that? He still has to pray. But he will not be rewarded for that prayer. He still has to pray. He, do, he still has to pray. He can't abandon the prayer. He still has to pray. But the reward is not going to be there for that person for 40 days. The prayer will not be accepted for 40 days for the one who goes to these fortune tellers and goes to these sorcerers. The next narration says, وَعَنَبِي هُرَيْرَةَ عَنِي نَبِيْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ قَالْ 
من أتى كاهنا فصدقه بما يقول فقد كفر بما أنزل على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم that whomsoever goes to a fortune teller, sorcerer, these types of people and believes in what they say then that type of person has disbelieved in what was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He has disbelieved in what was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the ruling upon this person would be that he is a disbeliever in what was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you cannot believe in what was sent to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and at the same time be believing what fortune tellers and sorcerers are telling you. You can't have belief in fortune tellers and sorcerers and at the same time combine that with belief in Allah and the Quran and the Sunnah and the Revelation. If you believe in the Revelation, you would know it's haram to go to the fortune tellers and those people. So you cannot have the belief in both of them. The two of them are opposites and they do not come together. So the apparent meaning of the hadith is that the person will be out of the fold of Islam. Kafir for the one who commits this action. وَظَاهِرُ هَذَا أَنَّهُ يَخْرُجُ مِنَ الْمِلَّةِ وعن أحمد روايتان في نوع هذا الكفر and الإمام أحمد has mentioned two narrations regarding this hadith does it mean that he is out of the fold of Islam if he goes to a fortune teller or sorcerer or does it mean that it is the minor kufr that he is still a Muslim he doesn't exit from the fold of Islam and in one narration it is even mentioned الإمام أحمد said التوقف that he said I'm not sure I'm going, I can't give you an answer so this indicates the severity of the issue. How severe this is. The narration says the one who goes to that person, then you've disbelieved in the revelation. You're a kafir in the revelation. And so this indicates the severity of the one who goes to those people. As Shaykh al fawzan says, Al-Zahir, what's apparent, Allahu A'lam, is the first opinion. That a person is a kafir out of the fold of Islam. Because you cannot believe in the Qur'an and at the same time go and believe in these fortune tellers and sorcerers. Because the fortune tellers and sorcerers, they are of the most evil of falsehood. وَأَخْبَرَ أَنَّهَا مِنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيَاطِينَ And the Prophet ﷺ has informed us that this is from the work of the shayateen. These fortune tellers, what they do, it is from the shayateen, they do these things. So whoever goes there and believes in that, knowing this is from the shayateen, from the evil, from the shirk, then that person you can't, Believe in those things and at the same time claim to believe in the Quran and the Sunnah. The two things do not combine in that way. So, as Shaykh Al-Fawzan says, what the apparent meaning of the hadith seems to be, is that the person is therefore exited from the fold of Islam, the one who goes to these fortune tellers and to these sorcerers. The next narration says, وَلِلْأَرْبَعْ وَالْحَاكِمْ قَالْ صَحِيحْ عَلَى شَرْطِهِمَا عَنَبِ هُرَيْرَى مَنْ أَتَى عَرَّافًا أَوْ كَاهِنًا فَصَدَّقَهُ بِمَا يَقُولُ فَقَدْ كَفَرَ بِمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى مَحَمَّدٍ وَلِأَبِيَ عَلَى بِسَنَدٍ جَيِّدٍ عَنِ بْلِ مَسْعُودٍ مِثْلُهُ مَقُوفًا So this narration has been mentioned by other scholars. The other scholars have mentioned this narration too of Abu Huraira saying that the one who goes to the fortune teller or the sorcerer and believes him then he has disbelieved in what was revealed upon the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So this indicates that this narration is mentioned in various forms, in various statements. So what does this indicate to us then? What are the benefits of these narrations? You can highlight those benefits into five points. Firstly, the complete and utter falsehood of sorcery and fortune telling. Butlanul Kihana, the absolute falsehood of this sorcery and fortune telling and these things that they engage in, and the fact that they claim to have knowledge of the unseen. All of that is complete and utter falsehood. That is one. Secondly, that you must believe that these fortune tellers they are upon falsehood, and you must believe that what they are saying is complete falsehood. You can't say maybe, maybe, rather you must be upon the aqidah that these fortune tellers and sorcerers are upon complete falsehood. Takzeeb al-kuhan wa nahwihim. So you have to declare them as liars and falsehood, uh, upon falsehood, these individuals. And you cannot have any doubt in yourself. You cannot have any doubt that these people are liars. 
You cannot have any doubt that these people, what they are saying are lies. You must be certain of that. You cannot say, I don't know, I'm not sure, maybe he's telling the truth. Impermissible. Rather, you must believe they are upon falsehood and upon lies. Also, what we learned very clearly was that it's impermissible to go to these fortune tellers and sorcerers. And not just physically, but even watching them on TV, on YouTube, listening to them uh, on a clip, anything of that nature is impermissible and haram. Fourthly, we learn that whomsoever believes in those people and goes to them, then his prayer will not be accepted for 40 days. In the first narration, it mentions a variation of it, even if you just go to them, not even mentioning whether you believe in them or not. Just going to them, then your prayer is not accepted for 40 days. And the fifth point which was mentioned was, تدل هذه الأحاديث على وجوب معاقبة الكهان ومن يذهب إليه من قبل ولاة الأمور that the rulers, the Muslim rulers in the Muslim countries, they should punish these fortune tellers and these sorcerers. They should be punished. And those people who go to them, they should be given some reprimand. The ones who engage in the fortune telling and the sorcery and the people who go to them. Because of how severe and how evil this is. The Shaykh says these types of people in the society, they are the types of people who cause terrorism. They are the types of people who would cause all types of evil and chaos between the people, these fortune tellers and sorcerers, and the people who go to them and start believing them. These are the types of people who end up causing the corruption in society, the extremism in society, the wrongdoing in society. So we have to warn against them with a severe warning and avoid them and abstain from them completely and utterly. And there is a severe warning upon the one who goes to them, his prayer not being accepted for 40 days. The chapter is lengthy. We'll conclude upon that point. That's half of the chapter, and we'll do the other half of the chapter next week, inshallah ta'ala. And then after this chapter finishes, there are more chapters still coming about different types of magic superstitions, Friday the 13th, all of these things, they are coming. These things are known from the olden times. Friday the 13th isn't something new. This is mentioned in the books of the scholars about these dates that they used to have. Now the famous date is Friday the 13th. Before they used to have other dates, the same way, different days and different dates. So these kinds of things are not new. So that's all going to come up in the following chapters, inshallah, when we get to them. We'll conclude upon that today. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Next week again uh, after Maghrib then, huh? After Maghrib again, inshallah. So approximately Maghrib, 8 o'clock next week, huh? If uh, one of the things you mentioned that you must absolutely do that absolutely liars. Hmm. So if somebody goes to them and... Uh, you tell them that, you know, this is the belief, that they are definitely liars. And he turns around and he says, well, something was missing and I couldn't find it. Mm. And they told me, so how can you say they're liars? So how do you answer that? No, because that, that when they do that, is because they are using the shayateen. They are using the shayateen from the jinn who come and tell them these things. So these people themselves don't have any knowledge of the unseen. They claim, they won't tell you, that I'm going to find out for you because I've got shayateen working for me who are going to go find out. They sit there and they say to you, we're fortune tellers, we're this, we're that, I can see into the future, I'll find out what's going on, where your things are. All of this act of theirs is a lie. Everything is falsehood, it's all upon shirk. How are they doing that? How are they finding out where this thing is? Because they used shirk, they did shirk, and they used the shayateen and the jinn to do those things. So they are complete liars. And the hadith we did before, we mentioned it. They get that one truth which the shayateen steal from the heavens and they mix it with hundreds of lies. So everything about them is false. They want the misguidance of the people, they don't want guidance for them. They give them that information where the item was so people believe in them more, then afterwards they misguide them more into shirk and other things like that. So a person shouldn't be confused by that type of thing. That is from the misguidance of these people. They use the shayateen to do those things to misguide people more. So tell them, even if they did that and you went to them, it was wrong to you for you to do that. You need to have the correct aqidah. Don't go to these people. They use shayateen from the jinn to do these things. They commit shirk with them. That's why the shayateen tell them what those things are. Tell them these things to tell, uh, make sure that they avoid going to those types of people. Does the unacceptability uh, of prayers uh, in the hadith include those that watch on TV? Yeah, we said. 
Some of the scholars, they say the same thing. If you watch it on TV, you watch it on YouTube, you watch it on the internet, these magicians and things doing their stuff, it's the same ruling. It's like you're going to them and you're watching them. Uh, but what if the person does it unknowingly? He didn't know the, the hadith or the ruling regarding this before. That's a different issue altogether then. Somebody who does something upon ignorance. Ignorance is a different topic altogether. Like what's the ruling upon somebody who does something out of ignorance he didn't know? And there are different rulings about that topic. But the one now... You inform them, and uh, magic is one of those things where it's not something where you can really claim ignorance. Magic is something which is known to the people how evil it is, how, uh, the impermissibility of it. Even people who are not educated about Islam, they know magic is haram, it's not allowed. No, in terms of watching it. Even watching it. Even watching it and these things, you need to educate the people and tell them the impermissibility of it. That it's haram to watch the magicians and haram to get involved in what they're doing and to look at what they're doing. So inform them, inform them from now, the ones who are uneducated, so they become aware of that, so they don't do it again. So we'll leave it there, inshallah we'll carry on next week.